Good afternoon, everyone, and warmly welcome uh, to this webinar today. Uh, we have chosen to, to call it the future of Swedish productivity. And the organizer is what we call the Productivity Commission, which is a new joint project between uh, the five unions within industry in Sweden and the think tank Arena Gruppen, who is a think tank close to the trade unions in Sweden, but without any party political affiliation. Uh, my name is Daniel Lind, and I'm running this project on a daily basis. Uh, and we have with us today three very distinguished guests. Uh, first and foremost, we have uh, Mr. Bart van Ark, Professor of Productivity Studies in the UK at the University of Manchester. He's also the Managing Director of the Productivity Institute in Britain. And he has for a long time been a leading figure in the productivity issues in the, in the global community. Uh, our second guest today is Klaus Eklund. For, for the Swedish audience, Klaus is a very well-known figure. He has been the chief economist for many years at the bank SCB. He was also highly involved in the policy change in Sweden in the late 80s and beginning, beginning of the 90s as a policy advisor. He's also an author of a very well-read book in Sweden on economics uh, and the Swedish economy. And he was also the lead researcher at the productivity delegation in Sweden in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, last but not least, we have also with us today Martin Linder. Martin is the chairman of Unionen, one of the fame five unions within industry. And Unionen is the biggest union in Sweden and also, I believe, the biggest uh, white collar union in the world. Uh, Martin is also a very sharp and uh, independent thinker on political and economic issues in general, which we will benefit from today, I hope. So the setup today is very classic. We have 90 minutes. We have two presentations by Klaus and then Bart, and then Martin will have the opportunity to give a a somewhat longer reflection on, on uh, Martin and uh, on Bart's and uh, Klaus presentations. Uh, we will have possibilities for questions. State them in Facebook and we will take care of them. Be sharp, be short, and be clear on who you want to, uh, who you address with a question. So before we proceed, I think it is, however, remind ourselves that uh, this seminar is arranged in the midst of a terrible invasion and a horrific war in Europe, in Ukraine. At least I think this should place our discussion today in some healthy perspective. And we at Arena Group and are, have, have the idea or we are, our ambition is to, to become a platform of discussion on the effects of the Ukraine war. Uh, we will do it from a political, from the political side, economic side, and more of the democratic, journalistic side. So, please tune in on that in the future. Uh, having said that, Klaus, the floor is yours. Please. Okay, I will then start by sharing my screen and hoping this will work. I don't know if you can see, there we are, great. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Let's see if we can get, there we are, fine. Thank you for inviting me. Um, productivity is a tremendously important issue. And you can see the quote here from Paul Krugman. In the long run, productivity is almost everything. It is really, it's the factor that decides uh, actually long-term growth income growth and it's the key of lifting people out of poverty and building a wealthier and more secure society looking ahead of course productivity will be even more important than it has been uh, since the greening of our economies mean that we need to economize with our resources probably a slowdown of population growth perhaps fewer people in the labor force also means that productivity improvements are necessary to enhance standards of living in the future so I'm very happy that uh, Swedish unions have decided to join forces and undertake this study. Uh, it's 
important per se, but it's also important, I think, that Swedish social partners show an active interest in this issue. Uh, it's a task that doesn't take much space in the public debate, which it deserves, so I'm happy to do this. Now, Daniel has asked me to go back in time and uh, start with the so-called Produktivitetsdelegation and the Productivity Delegation, which is now 30 years old, and I chaired that um, um, in those days, and I will try to um, firstly summarize the work of the delegation and the findings. Secondly, I will discuss development since, and thirdly, and most importantly, I will try to give my views on what the new commission should do. Uh, let me start then. Um, here you can see the cover actually about the main report, uh, which was an SOU, a government investigation published in 1991. Uh, the background is that Sweden showed uh, slow productivity growth in the 1980s. Many countries in the OECD uh, did have poor growth, but it was particularly obvious in Sweden. In the early 1970s, uh, Swedish GDP per capita was about 8% higher than the OECD average, but by the late 80s, it was actually 1% below average. Now, the productivity delegation was set up in 1989 to investigate why this has happened and what could be done about it. It was an expert group. Uh, no active politicians were members, but mainly economists from academia and some social partners. We also had some practitioners from business. The first chairman of this delegation was Alan Larsson, who is known to the Swedes. He was at that time head of of the Labour Market Board, Arbus Magnus Dyrusen. But in 1990, there was a government crisis and he was asked to uh, join the cabinet as Minister of Finance. And then I was asked to step into his shoes as the chairman of this delegation. Previously, I had worked as head of planning at the Ministry of Finance. The delegation turned out to be a huge undertaking. The delegation itself had no less than 19 members. On top of that, some 40 people were involved in writing 10 special reports on the labor market, capital market, et cetera, et cetera, which were input to the main report. We also published a separate anthology on the labor market. We worked hard to finish ahead of schedule. A productivity investigation must not be seen as slow and presented the main report, uh, which you see here, which was about 450 pages to the prime minister in 1991. The crash of 1992 then sucked up all political oxygen and our report, to be honest, was put on the shelf for a while. Some years later though, some of the, um, in the aftermath of the crisis, many of our proposals were adopted. Uh, when it comes to our starting point and methodology, now, I'm an old man, maybe you are not as old as I am, or probably not, but in those days, in the 1980s, I would say that four different hypotheses were in vogue among economists to explain the slow productivity growth in the OECD area. The first was that the slowdown was the result of a number of one-off effects, such as the oil crisis and policy mistake. The second was that the slowdown was caused by a weakening of several positive secular trends which had propelled the global economy after World War II, such as trade liberalization, reconstruction, pent-up consumer demand. The third explanation claimed that the slowdown was caused by increasing inertia, inefficiency, rigidities, etc. And the fourth kind of explanation claimed that management in big business had increasingly become fat cats, protecting old business, slow to adapt to changing circumstances. We took an eclectic approach and found some plausible answers in each of these explanations, but we carefully avoided to squeeze our report into any overriding existing narrative. Uh, this um, also meant that we did not really adhere to the dominant theoretical approach in our economists, the so-called solo model and growth accounting. The starting point of that approach uh, was a highly stylized view of economic growth, uh, where the contributions of capital and labor to GDP were calculated using rather intricate mathematical formulas. Um, 
the problem was uh, that the assumptions of the long-term equilibrium model really meant that long-term growth cannot be explained by, by the model itself because technical change was seen as something exogenous. In those days, the later sort of popular theory of endogenous growth was very young and not very developed. So we skipped that. We, we really, to be honest, we said that the solar model left out more than it explained. We were more practical people in a sense. We were more interested in another sort of um, strand, another tradition of thought, namely that which could be, could be, could be based on Schumpeter and in Sweden, Erik Damen, uh, where rivalry, innovation, frictions play a decisive role. So we took a very much broader perspective, trying to identify underlying driving forces and obstacles to innovation, investment, human capital formation, also including institutional factors. So that meant that creative destruction became a centerpiece in our view. Factors, it, the important starting point is, is really our view that factors of production are not static or given. They change over time. Productivity, innovation, high quality institutions build competitive advantage over time, upgrade these given sort of um, factors of production and make them more productive. And that was really what we wanted to investigate. Um, this meant that the important task was to increase the skills and competence of the labor market, speed up technical development, increase and improve the capital stock. To do this, we said that any society needs two things. It needs transformation pressure and driving forces. And they two, these two terms, we, which we invented ourselves, were the corner stores, uh, cornerstones in, in our report. Transformation pressure means that companies should not have an easy paved pathway ahead. They should be subject to hard pressure to improve to need to increase productivity to gain profits. Governments should not protect markets. On the contrary, markets should be open and companies must work hard to become profitable. With driving forces, we simply meant the incentives to improve the quality of production forces and improve the allocation of resources in the economy. Transformation, should, uh, transformation pressure should be high but if companies and organizations manage to meet them with high productivity, they should be allowed to be richly rewarded. So this was sort of the interplay of forces, the clash between pressure and incentives that, in our view, decide productivity gains in the long term. Uh, within this general framework, the delegation set out to investigate the changes of transformation pressure and driving forces uh, for human capital formation, real capital formation, technological development and resource allocation. What did we find? Well, very short, in, in a very sort of, uh, let me summarize very quickly. We noticed that human capital had suffered from poor quality in education, misallocation of resources, for instance, lack of engineers, poor governance. Furthermore, wage formation had changed sharply in the 1970s. The premium on education fell drastically uh, as wage differentials shrank, marginal tax rates were hiked. This diminished the returns of skilling, re-education, re and competence development. As regards real capital formation, it was hurt by repeated devaluations, which rewarded companies with higher profits without them having to contribute. Um, we had a continued weakening of the currency, which increased the real rate of interest and the cost of borrowing for investments. Domestically, we also noticed that corporate taxation protected all companies, but punished startups. Wealth taxes at that time were high and punished family-owned companies. Infrastructure investments were lacking. And all this, of course, slowed down technological development and technical change. In those days, Swedish company, a Swedish business was still concentrated big, old industrial companies with only a few successful new arrivals. There were some, though, in the retail services like IKEA and HM, but there were very few. Finally, of course, as a result of all this, resource allocation was hampered. 
um, large sectors, more than 75% of the economy in those days was shelter, infrastructure, construction, large part of the private service sector, and of course, almost all of the public sector. Other sectors such as agriculture and communications were also heavily regulated. So all in all, we found clear evidence that incentives for human and real capital had weakened. At the same time, also transformation pressure had weakened. So productivity had been hit by double whammy, let's say. So that's what we found. What happened after we published the report? Well, like I said, um, in Sweden, we went into a deep crisis in the early 90s. So our, our findings were more or less shelved. But when we came out of that, there was a period of intense uh, reforms. And some of those were more or less based on our, um, our advice, I would say. And the result uh, after the crisis was that Sweden, Swedish productivity growth became clearly higher than our peers. Um, between 92 through 2007, for 15 years, productivity in business rose rapidly, in particular in manufacturing. Part of the improvement, though, to be honest, uh, came or caused by the cyclical upswing after the deep crisis in the early 1990s. I cannot seriously claim that all improvement were caused by the productivity delegations advice. In retrospect, uh, looking back at our report some 30 years later, I still find it readable, actually. Several conclusions still hold, but there are some things that we should have worked more with, some things we missed. Uh, first of all, I think we should have worked much more, uh, both met methodologically and when it comes to policy advice, with the service sector. Sweden at that time had sort of passed the peak of manufacturing. Services were rapidly increasing as a share of GDP, and that created a number of new theoretical and empirical difficulties as regards definition and measurement of productivity. Uh, I'll come back to that when looking ahead. We should have worked more with that. Same with the public sector. Uh, in those days, um, public sector um, contribution to GDP was simply measured as the cost of production, uh, which of course is wrong. Uh, most people sort of automatically say that this understates the public sector contribution, but Actually, when we tried to look at the numbers, we found that it probably overstated the um, productivity in the public sector. Uh, I'll come back to that as well. The problems were consequently greater than official statistics told, but we didn't really look into that. We didn't really have the time to work out new ways to measure productivity in the public sector per se, and more importantly, how public sector influences productivity in the rest of the economy. Same thing with the financial sector. Um, it was more or less overlooked by us. Uh, here also is a problem with technical measurements uh, within the banking sector. And we failed to really appreciate those problems and the indirect of financial sector on the rest of the economy. And finally, another issues, issue which I later deplored that we didn't dig into was the difference between large companies and SMEs, small and medium sized companies. Large companies are often able to increase productivity more in the short term uh, because they can exploit, exploit global trade and diversification of suppliers, etc. But on the other hand, startups and new business uh, can have a great role longer term in reviewing or, re sorry, renewing technology and spurring innovation. Now, some of this issue have been ex uh, explored to some extent uh, in recent years, but not sufficiently. And I think, and I'll come back to that shortly, that the new commission would do good to really dig into some of these issues. Now, looking abroad, uh, what's happened in, uh, in, the, well, in the last four decades or so is that productivity has continued to decline. The slide to the right is from a new study from the World Bank. We don't have to go into the details, but you can see that the sum of well, total productivity is declining. Uh, both that productivity which can, uh, can be attributed to capital and which can be attributed to human capital has been shrinking. And as you can see, productivity growth in the uh, advanced economies, as it's called, is now down to below 1% annually, and it's been continuously shrinking. 
um, some almost 10 years ago, this was um, noticed by a number of internationally renowned economists who discussed something called sort of secular stagnation. Uh, Larry Summers coined that term uh, and um, he was a bit sort of surprised. I mean, in an era of rapidly rising educational standards and falling interest rates, we should expect productivity action to increase since we are more skilled than previously. And of course, uh, falling interest rates should lead to more investments in physical capital. But that did not happen. Why? Well, Summers claimed that the problem predominantly was one of lack of demand. Um, one reason for this could be uh, increasing inequality as the share of income going to the wealthy people increases, possibly savings increase as well. And thus we have less sort of demand pressure from consumption and investment. Another reason could be slower investment growth uh, because investors did not sufficiently take into account falling real rate of interest. And this would then result in too high demand for rates of return on investment. So many real investment projects were scrapped and more capital flowed into the financial sector instead or financial investments. Robert Gordon, he claimed on the other hand that the important problems probably were to be found on the supply side. Despite all the hype about the tech sector, innovation, according to Gordon, seemed to have slowed down, not giving the same positive societal returns as in previous industrial revolutions. Also, it seems that the skills obtained from education did not rise as much as the costs of education, meaning that the productivity in the education sector per se diminished, as well as the indirect productivity gains from education we would have expected in the economy as a whole. I don't think this debate has been fully resolved. So in a sense, we have an overdetermined explanation of the slowdown that you can see in the graphs here with underlying driving factors, both on the demand side and the supply side. And this analysis and this debate bear also on the Swedish case. And this leads me finally to what Daniel asked for. <laughs> After this long sort of take off, let me come to my, well, conclusions or recommendations. Uh, your uh, commission is facing a number of challenges, both methodological and economic, political. And I will try to offer some sort of views on what to do. First of all, I think it's necessary to be broad based. Um, productivity growth has slowed down all over uh, and has been more pronounced since the financial crisis in 2008. Um, a major factor seems to be the growth of services. As manufacturing share of the labor force has shrunk, employment has instead increased in the service sector. Productivity growth as measured has been slower in services, uh, meaning that this reallocation of capital uh, of labor has slowed down productivity growth overall. Um, while this negative trend, trend has persisted, international studies indicate that productivity gains have come from better education, innovation, and investments in physical capital. However, investments in real capital have been much smaller than expected given the fall in real interest rates. So these general, this general um, sort of view seems to hold also for Sweden. If so, any productivity study needs to be broad based. It needs to review the effects of the reallocation of labor between sectors while also studying the determinants of investments, quality of education, skills improvement, and so on. And let me therefore say something about these different uh, issues. I've, I've raised, I raised six of them here, uh, not in, in a particular order, it just happened to be that way. Once again, services. The service sector is growing ever more important. Uh, I hope you can include services therefore in your analysis more than previous studies have been able to do. Uh, there are studies implying that the main productivity challenges in Sweden lie just within the service sector. Manufacturing is doing well. Why is productivity slower in services? Well, there may be some measurement difficulties, but of course, historically, 
it has been more difficult to increase productivity when the product involves meeting a customer face to face, which makes it more difficult to substitute labor with real capital. Now that may be about to change because of digitalization. But digitalization also means that services and manufacturing are sort of merging any big manufacturer or any manufacturing company today hire a large number of white collar workers, often more than blue collar. A lot of the value added in manufacturing comes from service components. And at the same time, services are becoming more, let's call it industrialized. A lot of the tasks previously manual are today taken over by robots, apps, and AI. So old definitions and divisions between manufacturing and service are now obs blurred or maybe even obsolete. And therefore, I think this is something you need to deep, deep dig into. Um, public sector, same thing. Very important, in particular in Sweden, which has a big public sector, and also very difficult to analyze. Um, obviously, what happens in the public sector is extremely important for productivity development elsewhere in the economy. Education, healthcare, security, infrastructure, all affects productivity also in the private sector. Um, there are both empirical problems and statistical quirks. Um, if you look at sort of the, the way we usually measure productivity, it seems that um, costs have increased all over, but the results in many sectors in the public sector have not improved at the same rate. They actually seem to have fallen in some cases, for instance, education. And that is obviously detrimental to productivity in the entire economy. But here we have a number of methodological difficulties. Uh, educational goals seem to have shifted. Pupils are nowadays supposed not only to gain traditional knowledge uh, in the old sense, but also to gain an increased understanding of complex societal processes. At the same time, the number of children with a poor knowledge of Swedish language has increased. So teachers have had a tougher task in recent years. How do we take that into account? I would be very interested to hear if you can come up with some, well, solutions or answers to those issues. Similar questions can be asked about healthcare. A healthy labor force is beneficial to productivity in other sectors as well. And the Swedish population is indeed healthy, but there are some signs that productivity in the wide, in, in wide meaning is not as high as it ought to be. The average lifespan in Sweden is still long, but relatively seen compared to our peers, it has actually fallen. It's not as, we're not as high up in the ranking as we were 40, 50 years ago. So it seems in this respect that healthcare overall, uh, that the productivity of healthcare in this sense has grown slower than in several other countries. Why is that? Uh, and are there any other indicators uh, moving in the same direction. So my point is, once again, I think it's necessary to discuss at least uh, productivity in the public sector, not because you can solve perhaps all the methodological quirks, but because what happens in the public sector is extremely important for productivity developments in the rest of the economy. Looking at issues which I think are more central to your task, obviously innovation, technical change, um, also, here we have both methodological and practical issues. Uh, many people claim that we live in an era of historically rapid technical change. And we all know the immense hype surrounding new technologies, AI, uh, genome research, space technology. But still, <laughs> aggregate productivity is not rising the way maybe we should expect it to rise given this technological change. And why is this? Uh, how do, and how do we separate quality from price when technology takes leaps? Um, previously, we used hedonistic indices, and this is what the delegation looked into some 30 years ago. But that task has become increasingly complex as digitalization conquers more companies and sectors. An even more difficult question is how to account for customers' imp input with new data. We all know that when we interact with social media, shopping sites, when we look at ads on the screens, etc., we, the customers, actually supply the companies with new raw material, i.e. data. 
So we are both customers and producers at the same time. How should economists adjust input and output data to take this into account? Uh, well, there are a number of issues which I hope you can solve. Hmm. Fourth, internationalization. Uh, this is an issue which has become painfully important in recent years as pandemics and war have hurt global value chains, trade and direct investments. Historically, uh, internationalization has been an important factor driving productivity. So um, here we are seeing threats and what could be done about that. There are also some methodological difficulties. Value chains these days often run through several countries and jurisdictions with different rules of accounting as well as different tax systems. And that affects how companies choose to report where production takes place. That makes it more difficult to calculate national statistics. What is Swedish productivity data in a world where Swedish companies work globally? OECD is working with something called global value chain income. Is that something you think you can use? Or how do we account for Sweden be increasingly being sort of interwoven with all that happens outside Swedish borders? And what about the rise and decline of these global value change, the chains? Um, what will happen now as globalization seems to be in partial retreat due to wars, trade wars, hot wars, pandemics? Companies move to move from just in time to just in case. Trade becomes more regionalized. My guess is that this will hurt an open economy like Sweden. But and I would like to see you come up with some recommendations or advice on how to counter this threat. Infrastructure is obviously a very important source of productivity growth. This holds both for old style physical infrastructure roads and railroads and so on, but also from modern digital means of communication. And we know that parts of the existing Swedish infrastructure are crumbling. Railroads are crowded, creating delays in transports, roads around the big cities are congested, air connectivity to global hubs is in danger as Arlanda risks losing out in international competition. And looking ahead, I'm also a bit concerned. Sweden seems to have lost the edge that we had in the early days of digitalization, international rankings indicate that we're slipping. The role of the rollout of 5G is slow. OECD ranks the digital maturity of the Swedish public sector among the very worst. And then, of course, we have the physical infrastructure when it comes to energy and electricity. And here we are all aware of the acute and rising problems. I need to say no more about that. But here is the rub. Choosing among infrastructure investments is not easy. Measurement of the rate of return is complicated. Now, economists try to do that. And we are often ranking infrastructure according to social returns. Um, Trafikverket does that, for instance. But even when we come up with a way to rank investment according to societal return, Government and parliament may choose infrastructure invest investments with inferior public economic consequences. And we know that this is what they often do in Sweden. So here we come back to the wider issue of productivity in the public sector, including the quality of public decision making. Maybe the governance of public sector and public investment also should be an issue for you. I realize it's hugely difficult and controversial, but I would be happy if you dared attack that issue. Finally, human capital. The quality of human capital is the most important driving force behind productivity growth. What happens with human capital, our skills, our knowledge, and our decision making decides actually in a sense what happens with all the other issues that I brought up previously. This means that the quality of education is crucial, but also not only formal education, re-education, vocational training, retraining, skilling during the entire work life. And these days, this task crucially includes the training of immigrants with poor level of education, retraining of labor, labor which loses their job due to restructuring new technological breakthroughs, but also the ability to attract high level international experts. 
Now, obviously, this is not something which can be solved just by sort of increasing the number of years in formal schooling, which is the normal sort of political way of tackling this. Also here, we need a comprehensive strategy for lifelong learning, possibly with a totally new organizational structure. And let me say that a system of taxes and wages, which goes, which gives strong driving forces for upgrading competences. And here, there are a number of, I would say, disconcerting observations, the degradation of quality in schooling, for instance, I don't need to say anything more about that. But on a more general level, I think there's a great riddle. We have never been more educated than today. That goes for Sweden and many other countries. We have so much schooling, so much formal skills, but productivity does not seem to take off as a result of our ever increasing knowledge, despite sharply rising costs. So is there something wrong with the education system? Do we measure the right things? Let me, uh, as a sort of final provocation, uh, make an unscientific guess. As our economies moved from zero education to primary education, and then from primary to secondary education, many more people got skills, practical skills, which empowered them to perform more, first simple and then more complicated tasks. But today we move from secondary to tertiary education. That is much more expensive and often not at all as focused on productive tasks. And sometimes higher education is more consumption than investment. And very often higher education functions only as a very expensive screening function. So a very important task for you would to come up with a solution of how to focus higher education on skills which are needed in real economic life and makes the economy much more productive. With that, uh, I am done. It's impossible to summarize these ramblings into a coherent and concrete action plan. But I think it's still obvious that a broad comprehensive strategy is necessary, comprising a wide range of proposals to improve the quality of human capital, modernize the infrastructure, speed up innovation and digitalization, support competition and free trade. Your task is important and huge and difficult. Both the size of the undertaking, sort of the technical difficulties and the methodological obstacles that you will meet. And I think your challenges in this respect actually are much greater now than they were 30 years ago when I worked with them. But if you succeed, you will be able to give a great positive contribution to the Swedish economy, to competitiveness, to real income. So best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this uh, informative and clear presentation. We have some questions from the audience to you, but I, I leave them to later and uh, give the floor to Bark immediately. Are you ready? I am ready. Thank you, Daniel. And, Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Klaus, for this really good introduction and hard to step into your footsteps, but I'll do my best. Um, thanks for, for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, not you know, physically be in Sweden. Uh, thank you for your patience. I'll speak English today, which probably I'm causing this problem. Um, uh, but it's at least good to be here virtual and to actually uh, revisit uh, productivity in Sweden, which I've done a couple of times over, over my career. And uh, it's really great to see that there's new initiatives coming up in Sweden to, to drive the productivity story, which Klaas has already explained, is so important for um, uh, uh, the future of the economy in Sweden and everywhere else. Um, second point I would want to make is that where class been looking backward a little bit in terms of what has been done uh, on productivity and where are we at this point in time and gave some important uh, suggestions, which I completely share, which you'll see coming back in my talk, uh, where we have to go. I will take a, a little bit more of a forward looking perspective and we really try to identify what I think has fundamentally changed, because I do think that the productivity story today, and, and Klaus already hinted a little bit at that, is setting is sitting in a context that has changed 
very significantly over time. That has to do with technology, it has to do with net zero transition, uh, but it also has to do with the role of workers in, in the economy and the way they're associated with firms. So I really want to go uh, a, a little bit into this and also on the basis of that get to some implications that I think have for institutions, for how a productivity commission operates in a much wider institutional context where these things need to be addressed. So that's really my, my purpose. I thought what I would do though, before I uh, start going into the detail here is to uh, give you, I'm sharing my screen right now, to give you um, a, a little bit of an introduction into the Institute that I'm currently leading. Since, 19, uh, since 2020, I'm leading this Productivity Institute uh, here in the UK, it's a nationwide institute. Uh, it's not a productivity commission, but it does a lot of the work that the productivity commission has to focus on. And I thought that one really good way to actually give you a brief sense of what the productivity institute tries to cover is to show you this very short, it's only one hour, one minute, 48 seconds video, because I think it explains better than I can uh, say myself what the Productivity Institute is about. And then I'll obviously follow up a bit on that. And I hope that you can hear that, but if not, okay, if not, then Daniel will let me know. Productivity is the way a society transforms the labor of its workforce into products and services that improve the quality of people's lives. Traditionally, the more goods and services that are produced per hour worked, the more living standards rise. But since 2007, productivity growth in the UK has stalled. Why are conventional methods of increasing productivity no longer working? A brand new institute expected to be a leader in the study of productivity aims to find out. What regional differences are there? What impact do environmental factors have? What part does well-being play in productivity? These are just some of the questions that will be explored at the ESRC-funded Productivity Institute based at the Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. World-leading experts from a range of disciplines and backgrounds will work directly with policymakers and businesses to understand how best to improve productivity across the UK. The results will directly inform business as well as government policy. As the UK tries to recover from the impact of COVID-19, solving the productivity puzzle will be more important than ever to achieving a sustainable economic recovery. Now, this obviously uh, is very um, UK focused, but a lot of the topics that you're hearing here, of course, are relevant for pretty much any advanced economy, certainly advanced economies here, here in Europe. But, and I'll come back to some of the characteristics here uh, later, but I really wanted to share with you again what you hear in this video. And that is sort of a very broad based view that we have around productivity. The traditional view being productivity about something on efficiency, how businesses turn outputs into input, inputs into outputs. And that, of course, is still very much at the core of what productivity is about. But basically, the way we need to think about productivity now is that, um, you know, we have to look at uh, ways to sustain productivity growth, to make it inclusive so that everyone can benefit from productivity growth and that it helps policy and business uh, policymakers and business leaders to understand how you can improve productivity standards and at the same time living standards. And I will try to explain in the next 20 minutes or so why I think you need to take this comprehensive view in order to really move the discussion on productivity forward and to also really get societal support, whether it's support from business leaders, from policymakers or from workers to get the support to really focus uh, on this very important topic. Now, as I already mentioned, in a way, uh, productivity is about some measure of output over some measure of input. Uh, that's the way that you know a firm would look at it. That's the way we essentially measure this. But you know, to be honest, uh, the, the, the issue can be much broader. If you think about societal productivity, it's really about some outcomes that we do want to achieve and the resources that you require to achieve those. Whether this is 
whether you want to achieve better healthcare outcomes or whether you want to achieve a clean environment or whether you want to uh, create a more inclusive kind of uh, 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 economy. It's always about what are the outcomes that you're aiming for, what are the resources that you're requiring. That really leads us to rethink some of the key measures. I mean, a lot of the things that we're talking about and me as well here is about our measure of GDP, of gross domestic product that we then divide by some measures of input. But we really have to think much more broadly about these issues, about how can we expand the GDP measure to some measure of welfare that takes into account issues like distribution, like welfare levels, as well as sustainability. And these are important measurement issues that we need to deal with, but have also very important uh, policy uh, implications. And that's why it's really, again, important to take this broad based, uh, this broad based view. Now, I'm not going to show you too many numbers in this presentation, but I just wanted to show you a few and they're basically underlining what Klaas has already mentioned earlier. And that is the significant moderation slowdown in productivity growth that we have seen. We have to be careful here. Productivity is most of the time, luckily, fortunately not falling, but the growth rate is slowing and therefore its contribution to uh, economic growth, to wages, to living standards is uh, slowing as well. So here you just see three, uh, four countries, the US being the blue line, Germany uh, being the uh, brown or orange line, if you like, um, the UK being the red line, and then Sweden, I put in Sweden here, which is the, uh, the yellow line. And you can see that you know, at face value, these countries look close, but there are times that one country is overtaking another. For example, Germany actually outperformed US productivity levels, I'll put per hour this is. Uh, for much of the 1990s and early 2000s, but then the US uh, actually zoomed ahead a lot of that having to do with faster technological change. Uh, you also see that Sweden has had its episodes of catching up on the leading economy, certainly in the late 90s and the early 2000s, but then beginning to level off. And here you can also see the UK, which first of all was below the other countries in terms of its productivity level, but also leveling off more, widening the gap basically since the global financial crisis. So a lot of the work that we are doing at the Productivity Institute is figuring out what are these UK specific factors and what can we do about it? And they essentially come down to some key issues that again, are not just unique to the UK, they're just a bit worse in the UK, but therefore they're very relevant to look at it from a, from a perspective in other countries, including Sweden. One is the risk of a systemic, what we call underinvestment in components of tangible capital, investment in machinery and, and buildings, but also very importantly in intangible capital. Klaus already mentioned human capital. We talked about technology innovation, so that's knowledge capital, but also the way that organizations invest in uh, the way that they are processing uh, their inputs into outputs. So it's an organizational capital, if you like. Also, what we see in the UK is a proportionally large number of low skilled and low productive jobs, especially in small and medium enterprise. Again, that's an international phenomenon. It's just worse in the UK than it is elsewhere, but it is important to realize that small medium enterprise tends to uh, have relatively low uh, skilled and low productive uh, uh, jobs. That's of course not always the case, uh, but that is causing my third point really, which is what we call these long tail of low productive firms across industries. And there is a very, and I'll come back to that, you saw that also in the video, a very important regional component uh, to this. These low, small, low productive firms tend to be especially located in disadvantaged region, regions uh, in an economy. And again, that's true for the UK, but certainly also for other countries. So here you just see for the UK, I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but I just wanted to make the point that if you look at the left hand side, you see that the sort of darker regions are the regions that have a productivity advantage in terms of their level and their growth rate. The lighter regions are the regions that are, are falling behind, that are actually losing track. They not only have lower productivity, but are falling behind. So there's an increased regional inequality. And if you compare that with the chart on the right hand side, you can see that that is actually a bit of a correlation there with uh, regions that are have so-called low skill equilibria, which basically it's are the dark regions here. Those are regions where we have low demand and low supply of, uh, of high skills. Um, and, uh, and that seems to be very much overlapping with regions that are falling behind. So there's a big skills component to this productivity story, uh, but there's a big regional aspect to this as well. I'll come back to this important issue of skills which again, uh, Klaus has already also uh, um, uh, identified so strongly in, uh, in his talk. Now, before I go a little bit more deeply into this, I want to do a little bit of a thought experiment with you. 
you know, forecasting productivity is incredibly difficult. Forecasting is difficult anyway, whether you try to forecast GDP, I've been in that business for a while, uh, but forecasting productivity is harder because there's so many components on both the output and the input side. So instead of trying to forecast things, I'm going to do a little bit of a thought experiment, uh, experiment with you about what would it require in order to generate the kind of growth rates that we had in the past uh, what would what would that require in going forward? So if we just look, this is for the UK, and I'll show it to you for the for for Sweden in a minute. If you look here at this uh, a map here on the on the left hand side, you see the performance of GDP. So this is the total growth of the economy, uh, in this case from 1996 to 2006, and we divide it up into two parts. One is the growth of hours worked, and the other is the growth of labor productivity. If you add these two things up, hours worked plus uh, output per hour, that is that creates GDP. So you can see in the UK that in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had about a GDP growth of 3%, and about 75% of that was coming from productivity growth, uh, and the remainder was coming from the growth in hours worked. We then went into the financial crisis, everything sort of dropped off enormously, but then since the financial crisis, the economy did recover, but it recovered much more on, on the growth of labor and hours work than it did on the growth of productivity. Productivity basically uh, dropped off of, uh, at to about 0.4%. This is the low productivity, low skills component of the UK specific problem. Now, in going forward, there's one thing that we actually do know, you know, again, uncertain to forecast, but we can forecast reasonably well, we, uh, reasonably well where hours worked are going to go because we know the growth of the workforce, we know who's going to retire, um, and we know how many new workers are coming into the workforce. And in the UK, as well as in other countries, other advanced economies, that growth of the workforce will dramatically slow over the next decade. And we're already seeing that playing out in front of us since the corona crisis. In most countries, we actually haven't seen the workforce coming back to the same level as where it was before. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that a, a large group of older, more wealthy workers have decided to retire relatively early. They're not coming back and the younger workforce is just smaller compared to that boomer, baby boomer generation. So what you see in the UK here, that's dropping off. Now, here's the thought experiment. If we would have the same productivity growth over the next 10 years as we had over the past 10 years, the 0.4%, we would not grow the economy more than about 0.6% in the UK. If we wanted to grow as fast as we did in the last 10 years, we would have to add another 1.3 percentage points to this. And if we want to grow as fast as we did in the late 90s and early 2000s, we would have to have another 1.1 percent to this. That would in total add up to 2.9 percent. Now, 2.9 percent productivity growth, something we've done in a few years after the Second World War, but since then we haven't. And despite all the new technologies, it will be very hard to, to do this. Now, let's do the same experiment with Sweden. It's slightly different, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, of course, there was very rapid productivity growth, as you see in the left-hand side, uh, coming out of the, the crisis in the early 1990s in Sweden. Uh, then actually the labor force performance was better in the financial crisis that had to do with specific labor uh, support programs. Uh, and productivity was, of course, better than it was in the UK, as we've seen before. But still, we didn't achieve the same growth rate. Uh, and, it, and the productivity growth was significantly smaller than during the 1990s. Again, same thought experiment. We would have to grow productivity by 3% if we wanted to go back to uh, what it was in the late 1990s. So it's the same tall order than the UK is facing, even though the pressures are perhaps a little bit less than they were uh, in the case of the UK. The point we're really making of this thought experiment, this is not a forecast. The, the, the point of the thought experiment is, we have to double down on productivity if we want to get anywhere close to where we were, not just in the 1990s, but to actually where we were 10 years ago. Because this, this slowdown in the workforce is a given. So we have to double down on productivity growth if we want to generate the kind of growth that we need to sustain living standards, to turn to a net zero economy and all those kind of things. So that's the kind of uh, tall order, the kind of challenge that we have ahead of us. Now, a lot of what we're doing in the Productivity Institute then is, of course, a, a, around what are the main levers here. And there are lots of things you need to get around. First of all, we need to think about these investments in human capital and knowledge capital and organizational capital that I talked before. We need to think about the regional context. We need to leverage the power of place, as you may want to call it. We need to think about the policy and institution environment, which I will come to in a second. 
We have huge measurement issues. Again, Klaus referred to this earlier. Measuring the digital economy is more complicated than it has ever been. Most of the literature is pointing in a direction that yes, we are mismeasuring things, but we're not mismeasuring them that dramatically that this productivity problem that we're describing isn't there. So we, we, we do have measurement problems. Productivity may perhaps be a little bit faster than the way we're measuring it, but it's not anywhere close to what it was before. And then, of course, we have large transitions that we need to deal with uh, in going forward. So that's basically setting the stage for what I think are the key challenges in the decade ahead. Now, I'll, I'll take us quickly through all those and then talk about the institutional implications and then I'll be done. So first of all, there's the digital transformation part. The, the, the rapid change in what I would call a transfer from an old digital economy that was essentially driven by the transition from mainframe to the personal computer and the rise of the internet, everything that we've been seeing in the late 90s and 2000s, to an environment, the new digital economy, an environment that has ubiquitous access to the internet, that has gone mobile, and that makes extensively use of cloud services and cloud computing, and therefore allows also the rise of artificial intelligence uh, and all sorts of applications from that. This is a massive technological change, which is much more complicated than the digital transformation that we saw in the late 1990s and early 2000s. I'll come back to that in a second. The second is the future of work, directly related to digital transformation, the way that uh, workers engage with their, uh, with their companies, uh, the way they actually do work and the place where they work is dramatically changing. The third one, going clockwise here, is the transition to the net zero economy and the need to find another relationship between uh, fossil fueled inputs uh, and the outputs that those are creating. And then last but not least, there are these increased regional disparities, this tendency for low skilled, low wage labor to be locked up in disadvantaged regions. So let me quickly take you through some thoughts on each of those and then come uh, uh, forward with some uh, implications. As I said, we, when you think about digitization, you have to really think, uh, uh, make an important distinction between the technologies that we get, which are massive and so promising, and why we all think that, you know, the rise of advanced analytics and uh, uh, 3D printing and blockchain and robotics should give us a faster productivity growth. But that is very different from what we call the transformation process. This is basically the need to absorb these new technologies in a business environment to basically develop an enterprise strategy that leverages the digital technologies to connect organizations, to connect people, to connect the assets in that organization and those processes. And this is a very, very difficult process. And even the most productive organizations, the most advanced uh, organizations in the economy, I think you struggled for quite a while to get this right and still trying to work on getting this right. My argument is that the new digital economy is a much bigger challenge for productivity growth than the old digital economy was. And therefore, I'm, I am not so surprised, perhaps thinking about it, that actually we have a harder time to do this. So this productivity paradox that is there, I think can be very well explained because the complexity of uh, absorbing these new technologies. You need to change organizations, you need the competitions of your workforce, you need to completely rethink your business models. It's very different from what was done in the 1990s when we got the personal computer and the internet, which basically were nice features to have, but once we knew how to do it, it, it very rapidly helped us to, uh, to accelerate productivity. So there is this kind of what we call virtuous cycle of digital innovation. The technologies are there, but then you need into business innovation, which really is the processes of improving your process and creating these new products and services. And that will ultimately give you the higher productivity and profitability. And that's quite a journey which does require not just investment in your, in your STEM resource, in science and technology and engineering and math kind of skills and competencies. It does require investments in knowledge-based assets. So this is, uh, you know, how is your organization operating, the organizational innovations that you're making, which are key to this business innovation process. And it has big implications across the skill uh, set in your organization. Digital transformation is not done by a few people in white coats in an R&D lab. It's done by pretty much everyone in the organization who in their own way need to understand what the opportunities are uh, of these new technologies. When it comes to work, there, there are basically sort of three components in future of work to think about. How is the work done? 
um, who does the work? And secondly, when and where is the work done? And I think there are a couple of really important questions to think about. So when we go to how is the work done, again, I already mentioned this, this change in skills and competencies in a digital transformed organization are extremely complex. Uh, the way that we have to work together, the way that we have to uh, work in agile teams, uh, the way that we, are that we have to transition very quickly from one task to another in an organization is the way to actually leverage the power of these new technologies. Who does the work? As I already mentioned in, right in the beginning, the, the kind of link between workers and their employers is loosening. Not only is lifelong, uh, a lifelong job with one employer a guarantee anymore, that was already gone for decades, but also the way that actually uh, employers uh, can basically look after their employees has changed. They're quite often much more at arm's length. There's a lot of gig type of workers or other flexible workers, uh, a lot more self-employed who will one way or another work for, for, different, uh, 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 for different suppliers and for different customers. So there is really a new balance we need to think about on how to protect workers, how to support workers, but also how to incentivize them in order to improve their skills and, and indeed become more productive. And then there is the big issue of when and where work is done. And in a way, the COVID-19 pandemic has been perhaps the biggest kind of shock that we have experienced in, in the labor market, because suddenly we were, we were making a, a dramatic change to something that started very slowly before the pandemic. And it was an increased amount of telecommuting and an increased amount of people working from home. Overnight, we completely had to change this. Uh, and uh, now that we're coming out of this pandemic, it seems to have pretty large implications for how we're going to, to go forward. And I have just a few slides that I want to take you through to see how important this problem is. This is work from the work from home research. This is Nick Bloom and others at Stanford who are in Chicago who are doing this work. And, and the main things that I want to show you here and some of that you already have seen is that coming out of the pandemic, it seems that almost half of workers are actually preferring to continue a hybrid working model of about two to three days at home versus two to three days in the office. About 35% of employees, these are US data, by the way, 36% of employees want to go back to work full time. Many of them have to because they have no other option because the nature of their work is like that. And there are some people, uh, particularly also younger people who just benefit from being in a more sort of thriving environment than just working from home. Uh, but you can see that the majority of people prefers to actually have this kind of hybrid uh, working model. And this has huge implications for the way that organizations operate. The easy answer to this is for employers, and this has happened a lot, is to say everybody back to the office because this is too complicated. Organizations who really want to do this and want to, want to make sure that they, they, they deliver to, uh, to, to the preferences of their workers, have to really rethink uh, the way of working, the way you're communicating, the way you're innovating in an organization, and so on and so forth. Um, what uh, is also quite interesting here is that actually workers you know, have a very strong preference for this. In fact, when you know, this research does, it actually did ask workers, how much more would the company have to pay you if you had to go back full time to the office? And it turns out that on average, workers want to have about a nine to 10% higher pay if they have to go back into the office for about 10 days, for about five days a week. So this is quite substantial and, and it really shows how strongly the preference of a large part of the workforce are. This has leveled off a little bit. You can see here that, you know, by the end of 2021, that sort of premium on having to work in the office has slowed a little bit to $8, but it is still there, right? So, so you still have to go to 8% of current pay. So it, it, it's still quite an important measure. So this work from home issue as I said, it's the biggest uh, experiment in labor markets that we've done uh, in, in recent history. And the implications for productivity can be either terrible if we don't do it well, or they can be huge if we know how to actually handle this. It can make workers more happy. It can improve their well-being. It can help in our net zero transition. Uh, it can help in our regional challenges that we're facing. So there, there's just a massive opportunity here that I think should not be, should not be wasted. A lot of uh, uh, things about work, of course, is around sort of good work. Uh, how do we make sure that we create jobs uh, that have high quality? You see here some of the characteristics of these high quality jobs um, and, and how they uh, are positively correlated uh, uh, to, to productivity. And because of time, uh, pushing through this very quickly because I really want to get to the end uh, of the presentation and 
leave enough time for, for uh, comments and Q&A. The transition to net zero is highly uncertain from a productivity perspective. Um, I think there's very little thinking, frankly, from what I've seen so far on what the productivity implications of net zero are. And I think this, this can end up in tears if we really don't think clearly about this. If we think about sort of three categories, first of all, energy exploration, we have to think about how capital and technology is playing its role in this transition from fossil to non-fossil energy exploration. It's, uh, it's, it will require massive investments, but once things are settled, uh, will we have a more productive environment in energy exploration, or actually a less productive environment? Let's not forget that a lot of fossil fuel exploration was extraordinarily productive. The transition process uh, uh, for companies that are using uh, uh, fossil energy and need to go to non-fossil uh, leads to huge adjustment costs, which is okay, but ultimately needs to settle them in a situation where they can uh, have uh, advanced uh, uh, productivity. And we have to really think about what the, what the implications of that, that are. And then finally, once we're settled in something that we might call the circular economy, uh, the question really is how productive are green skills and green jobs? Uh, and what is the role again of innovation uh, in this? So I think there are really big questions on how the net transition, the net zero transition goes together with new technologies and with innovation in order to get the productivity effects. Because as I said, I don't, if, I don't think there's been that much thinking around the productivity implications. And if we don't think about the role of innovation in technological change, I think we might actually be very uh, um, disappointed by the productivity effects that we're getting from it. And then of course, finally, there's the regional uh, issue, uh, but let me, let me really go to my final slide, which, which is really on what are the implications of all this on our thinking for institutions? So I think what really has changed is that the institutional environment, if you think about these things, technology, there's changes in work, the changes in net zero transition and the regional inequalities, this kind of institutional environment is not just any, something that is just happening sort of between employees and, and, and employers. It's, it, it's, that's a very important part of the mix, but there are other parts that are important uh, to this. So some key institutional comments, again, going clockwise. First of all, big changes in corporate governance. Think about the, the move uh, for many companies to put uh, ESG as uh, the key components of market, uh, corporate governance, a completely different thinking around their stakeholders uh, uh, in this system. Uh, how do they operate in uh, uh, in kind of a public uh, in a public market? How do they engage with changes in the regulatory environment? Going clockwise, uh, the, the changes for employment law are very very important in this environment. We have to completely rethink how we actually trying, as I said before, protect workers, support them, and incentivize them in order to be productive, raise wages, and, and improve their well-being. So big challenges there that go uh, far beyond negotiations between employers and employees. Going clockwise on the right-hand side may be a little bit hard to see, but essentially this is an innovation system. I think there was a question a little earlier about the triple helix. So this is about business and government and universities and the education system as a whole. A lot of these changes have to take place in a, in a much more institutional environment, quite often at a regional and a local level, much more at a national level to really put things in the right context. And then last but not least, this goes even beyond that innovation system and is essentially a civil society issue. If you talk about inequalities and regional inequalities, you are going to talk about how civil society is engaging uh, in this, how, how, they do, how they are thinking about how the resources in the community or in a region are being used to create the outcomes that you that you desire. So with that, um, uh, let me let me let me finish there. Let me make one last remark on perhaps what we're doing in the UK. We are a productivity institute. Uh, we are not a productivity commission, as I said before, but we do have a productivity commission element here. Um, and this is really a group of uh, experts uh, in the field. Many of them academics, not all of them, who really sort of form an independent group of government and try to come up with what are the key policy areas in all its breadth that I've been talking about, what are the key policy areas that we need to address, and how can we create a sort of place where government, not just national government, but also regional and local government can go in order to understand the implications of uh, policy measures uh, from a productivity perspective. So, I think a very important uh, uh, way of thinking is also where, where does this uh, productivity commission sit 
in this whole com in this whole institutional environment? Is it independent of government or is it part of government? Where in government is it sitting? How does it coordinate between national government and regional and local governments? And uh, we have decided in the UK to actually start a productivity commission uh, as a rather independent group and more as an advisory body, although some of that may perhaps change uh, over time. So uh, let me stop sharing my, my screen. I, I hope I sort of brought up the key message that I wanted to deliver, and that is that I think that the context around productivity has dramatically changed, that the institutional implications that are huge, and that a rethink of what a productivity commission might do needs to take into account uh, um, uh, the other players in the institutional environment that, that need to be dealt with. Thank you. Many thanks, Bart van Ark. Uh... I just uh, passed the word to Martin with uh, just a remark that Bart's speech was very much about uh, the future of work, employment law, which is your home turf. So what are your uh, thinking about the presentations and your thoughts? Thanks. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Daniel and Bart and Klaus for very interesting presentations. Uh, and I'm glad that you said that because I'm after coming on after class and Bart to talk about productivity, I'm maybe not feeling in my home yard, but uh, I think I will maybe give my kind of perspective and reflection of what has been said in these uh, presentations. Um, uh, and I think one of the things uh, I think when I listen to you uh, from a Swedish context is that the mindset of the question of productivity uh, is very much in the core and DNA when you come to the trade unions and the employers organization who are uh, uh, connected to the industry. Uh, it's no coincidence that it is uh, five of the trade unions in the industry who is uh, financing this uh, productivity commission that uh, Daniel is running. Uh, but one reflection I do when I listen to you about this broader perspective uh, on productivity is that it's very, very, very rarely I ever hear someone at all outside the industry talk about productivity or think in a productivity perspective. Uh, and that is one clear reflection I do when I listen to you. Um, because for us, we have also institutionalized this, our productivity mindset, very much since the late 1990s. Uh, a clear date could be 97 when we signed, uh, and I have not a clue how I should say that in English, but uh, Industry of Talet, uh, that is now 25 years old, uh, that has for almost 25 years uh, delivered uh, real wage increases uh, for uh, employed in uh, workers in uh, Sweden. Um, and the basis uh, of this agreement since 25 years ago is very much a common view between unions and uh, employers about productivity, that it is our common interest, our common goal uh, to both work for good salaries and good wage increases, good conditions for the workers in the industry uh, and in the labor market uh, general, uh, but also to work that we need to work together to have competent, competitive businesses uh, in an international perspective. Uh, and without that, we cannot deliver uh, good uh, wage increases uh, and good working conditions. Uh, and you can also see that, that um, for the last decade, when the productivity levels has been uh, lower, uh, we have also decreased uh, our sal salary level uh, uh, increases during the last decades. Uh, where we from a union side often have had a lot of criticism about that, uh, but from I think it's good to see that we have a very clear commitment and a very clear perspective on productivity issues uh, between the trade unions and the employer organization in the industry. But a clear reflection that I do when I listen to you is how rarely we hear about anyone at all in the political system, uh, from political parties, from uh, other sectors, talk and think about 
their business, their strategy, uh, they, uh, the, their, all the different questions they have to handle from a productivity perspective. And I, I think that is a very important things to uh, bring on to the future that we have to have a wider perspective on this. Um, uh, and just this morning, uh, I was uh, myself in the parliament together with uh, an employer organization to talk just about the lifelong learning perspective uh, uh, and where we actually ended up just in a productivity perspective in that uh, question. Uh, and that was very useful discussion, uh, but it was not, uh, uh, how do you say, um, natural for the politicians to come into that question in that way. Uh, and from the labor unions and from the employees organization, we have done a lot of things the last years. Uh, when it comes to human capital issues, uh, we have recently signed, as people in Sweden know, um, this big agreement, Lars Överans Kommersen or Trygghets Överans Kommersen, that is very much about lifelong learning for real. Uh, and that is also a productivity uh, issue for us. Um, and what is maybe not so known in that is that you know, part of that agreement is also that uh, we should see if we could uh, make the unemployment insurance in Sweden based on collective agreements instead of the system we have today. And that is also, uh, a question and an insight from our perspective that we need to have a good safety net uh, for people if we should uh, be a driving force for, for more productive businesses where also people uh, will have to change job and will get the possibility to reskill and upskill. Uh, yeah, I think I can stop there for the beginning and see if there's any questions. Uh, many thanks to, to all of you. I just want to start with a with a short question on both Klaus and Martin said that there's a, not much of a discussion within politics today on productivity in Sweden. Do you have any more clear arguments why that is the case and how should it change? This commission is somewhat a little part of it, but how can we do it more? And to, to follow up that to, to Bart, I guess some of your work or your institute is based on the lack of discussion. So how is the discussion on productivity in, 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 in the UK? And is it a problem with, with, the, with the different departments dealing with productivity? So you don't have one department, you have many departments working cross-sectional to, to discuss and uh, measure productivity and increase the productivity in the future. Thanks. Do anyone have a word on that, Klaus? Um, well, productivity is a difficult concept, as we heard. <laughs> and uh, it's easier and fully understandable if politicians and editors and whatever choose to discuss other sort of targets or broader concepts, in a sense, like welfare, well-being, growth, income, whatever. But what I think the commission should do is really try to be pedagogical and tell and show that all these things are impossible without increasing productivity mm. and sort of show how they go together, um, like the, well, obvious, obvious reasons. And, and that is, uh, that's a bit difficult because productivity isn't a, a, an election winner when, it, if you, phrase it in terms of productivity, but you, it might be if you phrase it br more broader that, that both Martin, the way that both Martin and Bart have discussed. Um, but then, of course, there's another reason that these long-term issues sometimes disappear from the agenda, and that's simply because the agenda is overwhelmed by short-term or acute issues, which could be very important issues like war or pandemics, of course. Mm -hmm. So, but but your task is to keep the productivity fire burning, even if it over the the daily agenda is overwhelmed by other issues. Thanks. So, so, so let me first of all say why this actually is a hot topic in the UK. Uh, I, I I took on this role not being not being British, as you may have heard from my accent, 
uh, because the UK in a way is ground zero when it comes to productivity. So in other words, you need a bit of a crisis in order to begin to pay attention to it. And you know, I show you that line where the UK was leveling off more than other countries. So, so th th I think the realization in the policy environment was there. there is, we have a real problem here because there's no reason why we should be doing worse than other countries. The other region, and, and I think Sweden may not have this issue right now. The other issue, however, that I do think is important is the realization with the link with regional development and inequality, mm. which I think, again, Sweden is not as bad as far as I know as the UK and, and some other Anglo-Saxon economies, but still you have inequality too. And a lot of that inequality tends to be tied up at a regional level. As I said, you know, low incomes, low wage, low productivity, small, medium, agile enterprises tend to sit in the more disadvantaged kind of regions in an economy. And that awareness in the UK has led to really make productivity an important part of what is called the leveling up agenda here, which the, you know, the, the government is extremely committed to. So I think, I think we have crisis on two fronts. Productivity slowdown and the regional inequality has a very large productivity component to it, and that's why it's become central to government. The second point I want to make is the productivity narrative, because I think one of the reasons why employers and unions can talk well about this is that there's a fairly common understanding what this is about. It's about how companies become more efficient and that some of that, the gains of that efficiency will be translated into better wages and better working conditions and everything else. So that concept is clear and that's been clear for many decades. And that's why that's a good place to actually have these discussions. And I don't think we should actually do away with it. My problem is that the issue is broader, but the narrative also has been changing. This is not mm. necessarily anymore about improving output over input, which is a kind of a technical concept, or it is not necessarily about business efficiency. It mm. is about the performance of the public sector, which is growing by size mm. over you know, every year again. And what is the performance? How can we deliver outcomes and healthy people in an aging population uh, with limited amount of resources we have available? How can we make a net zero transition? How can we get to this, this kind of environment in a way that our resources in fact allow, uh, allow us to do this? And this is not just a matter of how much budget is there, but it is how we're actually using this budget in a way to achieve outcomes with limited resources that we, that we have available. So I think it's very important to work on the narrative on this. And this is one of our important goals is to make sure that you know, the, 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 the perspective doesn't have to be the same, but we need to understand what the different parts of this productivity discussion are. And I think that's important to have to work. Well, thanks. Martin, do you have any idea on the, the lack of discussion in Sweden? Uh, well, I don't know what I should add, but I think it's, uh, I think that is what is meant by narrative. Uh, if I understand that correctly, that term, it's, uh, well, I think we all have a big uh, responsibility to, talk about this in a way so people understand it uh, mm. kind of the, uh, under the headline that uh, there are no free lunches uh, what we mm. want to do we have to create mm. added value to create what we want to do uh, in also the big picture in the society uh, and my reflection when I listen to you is that I think we have uh, quite a long way to go there actually mm. yeah thanks uh, I just want to pop in a question from uh, from Jan Erik Novaki, which Bart mentioned briefly. It was a question uh, to Klaus: What is the influence of triple helix on the total fa factor productivity growth? Uh, well, do you have I an idea of that? I don't know. You don't know? No, I, you, I, I think it's almost impossible to have any good answer or to measure it even. I'm sorry. Maybe Bart, you've studied this. I don't know. I don't know anyway. There is some good work going on at particular European Union level, European Commission level, that is looking at some specific strategies on how regional ecosystems, regional innovation systems work. Because a lot of this triple helix, as I think I mentioned in my in my talk, a lot of this is happening at regional and uh, local level. That's where businesses, um, government, and schools meet each other and try to see how they can actually move their agenda forward, taking account of the local and the regional context they are working in. And uh, there is a fair amount of evidence, both at European Commission, I should associate the, o associate the OCD regional center in Trento is doing a good deal of work showing that um, environments where in that sort of 
that kind of collaborative attitude is is uh, present uh, are doing better in terms of what they deliver in terms of outcomes. Um, and again, I think in today's world, probably more important, because if you think about digital transformation, if you think about net transition, net zero transition, this is not done by one firm. You know, it's done by lots of firms. The government has to play a critical role in this. There's a big question about what are the skills and competencies. So the education system needs to sit in the middle of this. So it makes a lot of sense to, to actually think of those things at a regional and a local level. And, and I think the evidence is pointing in the direction that these kind of ecosystems, as I, you can call them people, the triple helix, I call them innovation ecosystems, uh, mm -hmm. are quite important for the productivity agenda. Many thanks. Uh, I think another question for, for, for Bart from my side and Klaus maybe is uh, one topic discussed also is the, the big difference between the global leading firms in terms of productivity and the domestic local firms, so to speak. And that difference has grown over time since the, the emergence of the global value change and the lack of diffusion of productivity, you can say. Uh, there's a question here from Pontus Matson who just ask, asks about that. He says that, do you have any thoughts whether slower productivity is driven by slower productivity growth of the most innovative firms or whether it is a higher level of low performing firms or something similar? So how should we understand this uh, diffusion issue? So to, to I'm happy to start class. Uh, um, to a large extent, this is an empirical question. I mean, mm -hmm. both are true. It's true that in this environment of increased concentration effects of new technologies and leading firms, that there is an element of those leading firms perhaps struggling to actually move to the next stage of productivity growth. So, so we do see that, uh, and this is not necessarily the big tech firms, this is about the big firms that are adopting these technologies yeah. that employ a lot of people, and that that adoption is actually as I, as I mentioned during my talk, actually quite complicated. So I think that is one part of the story and there are a big share of the economy. So they really count. But it is also true that at the, the long, in the long tail, there are lots of firms that do not really grow quickly enough. And this is a really difficult question. And I, I don't know the Swedish context, so maybe Klaus can talk a little bit more about the mm -hmm. Swedish context. But in the UK, we know that this very long tail consists of a lot of firms. It's very easy to start a firm in the UK. You, you basically have a call to the Chamber of Commerce and you know, 10 minutes later, you basically have a firm. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you now grow this firm into a kind of productive entity? And it turns out that a lot of companies are start but never grow. And quite often that is because there's no ambition to grow. There is no, there's no market that I really want to go into. But sometimes it's also because they, they find it difficult to get over this tipping point of hiring employees, hiring more managers, improving their skills, accessing this difficult technology environment and innovation environment that we're seeing. So, so I do think that there is a kind of concentration of these low productive firms that don't grow. And a debate here in the UK is, is that a problem? If a firm doesn't want to grow, well, then they don't want to grow. But it is a problem if firms do want to grow and face, um, face barriers that they find difficult to overcome. And, uh, you know, what is more important, again, is an empirical question, but I do have a tendency to think that because of the, the large size of the frontier, that a lot of the issues are actually need to be addressed at the, at the frontier, but not doing away with the issue of regional inequality, where in particular small enterprises play a big role. Thanks. Klaus, any comments? I don't have any empirical knowledge, but my hunch <laughs> is that the differential between, let's call it the leading tech firms on the one hand and the long tail of the smaller companies, that differential has grown. I mean, go back 30, 40 years, you had a more sort of homogeneous uh, set of companies and they went through the same, a little bit slower technological development. But now that digitization and globalization comes in spurts and fits, it's much more difficult for the smaller companies to sort of participate in this. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that the the difference between the, lead, let's call it the leading firms and the lagging firms has increased. But to be honest, I don't really know. That's a guess. That's something for you, Daniel, to answer in your commission. Very easy, very easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, we are actually running out of time. I think we should discuss for, for a few hours more, but uh, I just want to give you uh, a short finish finishing word on 
Uh, what are the most concrete reforms you suggest? The three most concrete reforms for a growing future of Swedish productivity or UK productivity when you also include the inclusiveness and net zero economy. So a broader perspective. What are the main topics, the main reforms? Please. You want the you want the reforms to be main and concrete at the same time. That's yes. impossible. I, I just repeat what I said. Um, uh, first of all, most important, improve quality of human capital. Uh, that is changing the educational system, make it much more inclusive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and you can discuss a thousand ways to do that. Secondly, in Sweden, uh, modernize infrastructure. I would say mm -hmm. because we are slipping behind in so many areas from everything from from 5g to electrification whatever um, third one is uh, let's call it make society more innovative we have succeeded in creating a group of you know fast growing companies mainly in the tech sector and and some spin-offs of that but we need to try to get that into what what bart called the long tail i don't know how that can be done but to me, those are the three most important areas. And I know I'm not concrete, but um, mm. I'm just a wretched economist. I'm not sort of the fixer. Okay. Okay, Martin, do you have any concrete ideas? You have this uh, educational reform, but... Uh... Well, I would uh, say that. And I think one very important issue is to... Uh make uh, lifelong learning be for real for very many people not see that it's kind of a stru new structural reform you have to do uh, to see that people during their working life can reskill and upskill uh, uh, during their working life i think that is a very big reform we have to do um, uh, the infrastructure issues in sweden uh, in is very important as well i agree about that and i think one uh, kind of uh, threat we has to have to handle is uh, the situation in the world right now where uh, increased protectionism and uh, could be uh, very harmful for the Swedish economy. Sure. Thank you, Martin. Bart, you're the last one. W what more is there to say after all these incredibly bright uh, uh, views on, on things, which I all agree with. The, the thing I think that is critical to this, and it's kind of underlining what I've tried to say today, is the sort of the, the secret sauce that brings this all together. Productivity has thousand different parts to it, and we mm -hmm. all need to do our bit and our piece. So it's, yes, it's about investment in human capital and innovation, and it is about infrastructure, and it is about better employment policy and everything else. But it is also very important that all parties uh, really are in this together. So collaboration and coordination is important. You asked this question early, Danielle, about mm -hmm. um, how does this work with you know, different departments in government having a responsibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly true. The problem is the political agenda is not owned by the Department of Economics or the Ministry of Finance. It is everybody's agenda. And having that ability to work across departments, but also to work between central government and regional and local government is a real, real challenge. And so I think a lot of this goes into sort of much more political science type of questions. How do we collaborate and how do we cooperate? And frankly, I think in Sweden, in Nordic countries generally, you're doing better on that than we do in Anglo-Saxon economies like the UK or the US for that sake. But I think everywhere we have this challenge of making sure that what we've done in the past is still working in the future. And because the context of, of productivity has changed so much, you always, even if you think you're doing okay, never be complacent about this because it might mean that we're actually collaborating in a way that's not quite the right way to get at the issues we need to address. So, mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, building these ecosystems and see what works in, from an institutional perspective is really important. That's a very nice end, I think, and very, very much a Swedish way to see it, how we collaborate, as you say. Uh, uh, and also, I want to finish to say that for the audience that we will have coming upcoming seminars on on many of these issues brought up today. And the next seminar is on the 26th of, of April, where we will have uh, Danny Roderick discussing uh, globalization, manufacturing, and the future of industry policy. So note that in your calendars. And uh, thank you very much, all of you, to participate in this and listen to this. And we see you next time.
Okay, thanks.